Well, it's the Rural World, the Rural Vintage Baseball Podcast, talking to vintage baseball players, coast to coast, border and border. And here is tonight's host, the Cougar, Jeffrey Kozlowski. Into the driver's seat we go. Hello, everybody. Hello, Barrel Roller fans. Welcome to another episode of Roller Out the Barrel, coast to coast, border to border. We're talking vintage baseball uh, all matters, all elements, all players. And we got a fun one for you tonight. We've got a we got a man who has got a lot of experience, a man who has lots of stories to share and to tell, has been really one of the the fundamental elements of the Greenfield Village Historic Baseball Program. And we were very excited that he made some time for us today. Uh, please give a warm vintage baseball welcome to Mr. Bill Whipsaw Dean. Billy, how are you doing, my friend? Good, good. Thank you, Barrel Roller and Jeff. I'm I'm very excited, happy to be here. I I put on my Lottie Dow uniform early this morning. I've been sitting here all day in it, just waiting for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you look great. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the good folks at the studio, uh, know that we are wearing it in times when it's not on the field. Otherwise they'll get mad at us. So, <laughs> uh, so we are, uh, so we're talking here, we're going to be talking with, uh, with, with Bill Dean, we're going to be talking not only Greenfield Village historic baseball, but we're going to be talking historic baseball and a lot of its evolution, uh, over the course of the time of, but we we would be remiss if we did not bring out the uh, the soothing voice of the Roller Out the Barrel podcast, the Barrel Roller himself, Matthew Barnard. Matthew, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm doing great, Jeff. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm excited about being in the back seat. Uh, you're in the front seat driving. Am I in the back seat with William, or is he in the front seat with you? Is he like shotgunning? What's going on here? Bill is in the passenger seat navigating. Uh, I am going to be in the driver's seat uh, taking this taking this bad car for a roll. And it's funny you bring that up because uh, we've got some car things we got to talk to Bill Dean about. This is a man who's got a lot of experience in car design. And boy, we're going to get some opinions out of him, some work and stuff out of him. Uh, so, and before we start, I would be remiss because I know he is listening, actively listening here uh, but to one of the members of the Roller Out the Barrel team, we want to th- shout out a happy birthday uh, to the Yeti himself. Uh, so Landon, happy birthday to you, my friend. We appreciate all your hard work and all that you do uh, for the team, for the podcast. I would like to say, Matt, before we get started interviewing Bill, um, I noticed like with the logo, like Rudy's got a logo with him wearing a barrel. And mm. I know Yeti's got a logo of him wearing a barrel. Mm. How many, how many episodes do I have to <laughs> either host or co-host to get a ferocious mountain lion wearing a barrel? Uh, it would appear uh, after tonight. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Yahtzee. <laughs> I'm just kidding around with you. But <laughs> You know, they could always say, you're good, but are you logo good? <laughs> Today, I could say, we're working on it. So I think we talked about that in Flat Rock, Jeff. Did did we not have a discussion about this? Yes, we and, did have a discussion uh, about it. Out. And then, you know, old age hits in and you forget about things until you're reminded about them. And... uh but I do have notes written down somewhere for a logo, and, and I have easy access to to that. So you can expect something within two weeks. I promise you, <laughs> something well, for you all have... of. Can we sell it at Greenfield Village? Probably not. So uh, <laughs> I will be out in the parking lot at Worlds with a box of T-shirts, uh, like the old concert days, or at the old Tiger Stadium out in front, sitting next to a bucket in a box full of T-shirts that say Cougar. Oh, it'll be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe, like, when we talked about it, I said I, I wanted to be, like, uh, the the panther from Zootopia, like Mr. Manchas there. So 
of something that's family friendly, but still looks mildly ferocious. Like you when you're pitching. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Touche, touche. And with that. (laughs) Uh, So again, with us on the show here, uh, Bill Dean, again, we really appreciate you uh, on the, on the show here. Uh, Bill, a member of the the Henry Ford's Historic Baseball Program, as both a a la di da and a national. Of uh, while I'm thinking about it, because I don't have the notes on it down. Uh, Bill, which uniform do you prefer, la di da's or Nats? Ooh, that's that's a good one. Um, it depends a little bit. If it's an extremely warm day, I think the Nationals uh, jersey. It's a little bit lighter material. But um, most days, uh, I've got to go with the traditional um, la di da. It's a t- it's a it's a tough call because now that we got the new la di da shirts that are they are both long sleeve, and so um, I know you were you and uh, I think Soap Dish one of the pioneers of rolling your sleeves up uh, for uh, for better range of arm motion. But also the I, I preceded the um, creation of the Nationals in terms of at least the Greenfield Village version. So uh, I'm always consider myself first and foremost a uh, a la di da. That is a that's was used to be a very hot button topic there about you know players where they saw themselves as either a la di da and a national. Uh, let's let's jump into that and kind of. We'll we'll work our way into that, Bill. Um, tell me about how you found baseball. Like, how did you find? What is your earliest memories of of the game? Oh, personally, playing. Uh, you mean little league, um, right? So uh, uh, you may or may not know. I lived in Huntsville, Alabama, as a young man, as a as a grade schooler, and. Um, uh, my first team was the Weatherly Wildcats, and um, because we played down in Alabama, the it was so warm in the summer. We only played night games under the lights. So one of my memories is um, hitting a lot of really nice line drives off of um, Mister Gray, our coach, during practice with the with the old beat up practice balls, and then. And then we get under the lights and with a brand new white ball and it, it was glowing like the moon coming at me as a, as a fourth grader. And uh, yeah, it is very difficult to make that transition. So it took a while before I started hitting the ball actually, but um, yep, I was a weatherly wildcat and I was a brave later on. Um, um, and then uh segued into different sports. So it wasn't until, um, until I was a grown up, I started playing more, uh, mostly softball and then, um, discovered, uh, one fine day, the, uh, the fun of vintage baseball. Bill, uh, before we go farther into your career, I want to go back and say one thing I'm shocked to hear that the invention of lights at baseball fields happened when, uh, you know, when you were a kid and also, uh, <laughs> nice, what nice. was baseball? What was baseball like for you before little league when you're around the neighborhood and you're getting your friends together and you know, what, what, what were those games like and the rule sets and stuff like that? Um, yeah. So I lived on a dead end court and, um, so it was really easy to, to make a, uh, a baseball field. Uh, out of that with different driveways and things like that. So, of course, we played things like, like kickball, too. But um, uh, we uh, we got out the baseball. We hit it around. We, uh, we put one through Mr. Chapman's uh, second-story window. Uh, then we I think we s- took some time off and then probably switched to uh, kickball after that. Um, but um, – very, very big on the baseball cards. Lots of, lots of baseball card uh, collecting. Um, I was fortunate enough, my mother allowed me to attach the baseball cards to the wall in my room. 
And uh, so I had a, a row for uh, the Cubs and another row for the Braves and the Cardinals. And uh, I just had baseball cards stuck to my wall. Um, living living close to Atlanta, all we got was National League games on TV. So uh, I grew up uh, as, as a uh, Cincinnati Reds fan. So, so, right. so I got part two of this. I mean, let me okay. follow this up, Go Jeff. With you, we're talking about baseball cards and everything, and you're putting them on your wall. So you have an answer to this question: What was the card for you, Bill? What was the one? Oh, Willie Mays. Yeah, yeah. I had Willie Mays didn't go on the wall. Willie Mays was he was in a cigar box or something in the in the drawer. He was a special guy. I just came to find out Willie Mays, I think, is the the oldest still surviving baseball Hall of Famer. I think he's in his in his nineties now, but he's he's the the oldest in there and still still going strong. Um I just read a I just read a book on the nineteen seventy three season of Willie May of Millie Mays' uh, last year. Uh, as a member of the New York Mets and uh, how he almost, almost went out a winner. So, yeah, so Bill, let's the, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Most of the kids in the neighborhood uh, followed teams other than, than the Braves because they weren't very good. Uh, similarly, um, uh, the Atlanta Falcons weren't very good either. So, uh, we didn't have any professional teams in Huntsville, so um, everybody just kind of, based on whatever, chose uh, the Vikings or whoever. And I was a, yeah, I was a Cincinnati Reds fan and a Kansas City Chiefs fan back in the days of Lenny Dawson and Otis Taylor and Elmo Wright. Okay, taking you back. So, a few years. <clears throat> so that's so. Are we talking AFL? Or are we talking AFC? Oh, it was after the merger. It was after the yeah. Um, yeah, my next door neighbor was a Dolphins fan. I had to put up with uh, with their success, but um, I, I'm, just, you know, Patrick Mahomes has has redeemed me as a Chiefs fan. Um, but uh, yeah, I was a I was a second baseman out on the out on those red dirt baseball fields in Alabama. And um, I was left-handed, like most second basemen. Um, and so, of course, Joe Morgan was my was my uh, idol, and I emulated his uh, his batting style up until the point where um, where he usually would hit the ball, and I wouldn't. But um, I still blame the glowing <laughs> moonlike sphere for coming at me. Um, Well, those those dolphins fans can be pretty pretentious if I uh, if I know anything about that. Yeah. Go dolphins. <laughs> so, <laughs> so So Bill, you mentioned uh uh you know finding vintage baseball. Let's let's dive into that here. Let's be pre pre you getting involved. How did you stumble upon vintage baseball and what were your earliest memories and thoughts about it? Yeah, very literally stumbled upon it. Um, um, I'm at the village with the family pushing, I think, my daughter in a stroller. Um, and we crested the hill there right above Walnut Grove. And, you know, I had to blink and rub my eyes. I'd say, what, what is this I see in front of me? But it's some sort of baseball match. And uh, so my first impression was, um, wow, baseball. And then followed by, wow, these guys aren't very good. Because they had, you know, <laughs> they had a curator playing shortstop and a librarian pitching, and and I'm thinking to myself, uh, I could probably make this squad. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna place a call. Um, some team from Ohio was just just drubbing them pretty badly. So uh, we called a friend of mine, Bradley uh, Bradley Streetcar Pfeiffer, longtime Rochester. Granger and uh, Swamp Frog, 
Uh, but he started with me as a Lottie Da back in 1990, whatever. So can we, uh, let's be talking about being on Walnut Grove. Let's talk about how the field was arranged. Cause those who, you know, those who may know, like the, it's changed a little bit in, in the times that we've known it. Right. Yep. Yeah. Originally, um, prior to uh, people, I'm sure don't know that the carousel was actually down there at deep center field. Um, and, and, the home plate, instead of being where, where it is today, was straight in front of, it was in the center of the uh, uh, area, like where one of the benches is right now. So um, instead of going uh, straight down the hill, at the bottom of the hill, the, uh, the left field line actually went up the hillside where the people sat. So people would sit on the hill, sometimes not realizing they were in fair territory. And They still since do I that. played left field at the time, yeah. <laughs> since I played left field, um, it was a it was a long day, usually running up and down that hill, um, retrieving uh, base hits. But um, you know, it was a smart move to move it, uh, move it away, so it made more room for people to sit. But uh, we and we were playing uh, we were playing bound rule uh, when I started. Uh, probably the first uh, six or seven years. So if we were to put a, like a rough year on it, we're talking probably 95, 96, where, where would you pinpoint if you just say it's your, you know, your introduction? Yeah, I think it was 96 when I started and I played a, a whopping uh, five matches that year out of the eight on the schedule. So it, it is uh you know, it has changed uh, quite a bit over the years. Um, one of the matches we, and then we traveled down to Tiffin for the Heritage Festival. That's where I I first met uh, Rudy Frias, and he had these youngsters running around uh, that are now uh, full fledged uh, gigantic baseball players now. But um, <laughs> uh, it the, my first year, I was nicknamed the engineer because I worked at Ford and was an engineer and. While I respect the idea that you should have other people give you your nickname, after one year, I decided I, I don't want to be the engineer. I'm going to, I like trains, but I'm going to have train people coming up to me, asking me train questions. Um, so while I was in Tiffin, I saw a couple guys using one of those pit saws, um, also called a whip saw. And I said, now that sounds like a more dynamic nickname. I'm going to, I'm going to change to that. So starting in the year two, I was whipsaw. Uh, William, how far into your career with the Lottie Dawes would you say the transition happened from bound to fly? And what were your thoughts of it at the time? Yeah, it was, it was the, it was timed to, um, when they first started the world tournament and they wanted to reflect the rules that were played by in the world tournament, 1867. Um, so yeah, I had been playing bound rule maybe five years or so. Um, and so I, I was, uh, I was fine making the switch. Um, but there, I think in in the process we lost some of the um, some of the nice nuances with the rules. Uh, in particular, um, well, for instance, now when someone finds out I play this this game, they ask me what's different from regular baseball, and the list is is way too short. Where prior, when we were playing bound rule. Um, You'd, you'd see a lot more people uh, watching the game saying things like, wow, what just happened? Why is, why is he running back to that base? Or how come he's out? I need to find out what's going on. Um, so I do, miss, I do miss a lot of that. And, and also the, the skill set uh, worked better for me in, in the bound rule game with placement hitting 
and not just uh, not just straight up power hitting. It's it is truly like a like it's a it's a it's a different game uh, to be able to go from fly rule to bound rule bound rule to fly rule, uh, you know to a you know sixty seven the way the the la di da's play compared to a sixty four or a sixty or a fifty eight. Um, it really does feel like a just a different game when you go from one to another, right? Yeah, and uh, honestly, I, I will tell you, I was when we were playing bound rule, I was also playing softball, and there was at least one instance where I was in the outfield and the ball was coming to me, and I couldn't remember was I supposed to catch it. What I could, is okay if I let it bounce? <laughs> Wait, I have a glove on my hand. That means something. What does that mean? Oh yeah. So um, yeah, it's kind of hard to keep them straight when you're switching back and forth. Um, but but no, the uh, uh, the the fly rule is a more demanding game, and um, whether that's the reason or not, just to see the evolution of of the game over the years and and uh much more athletic um baseball players that have come on board and and really uh raised the level of play uh i think in terms of the uh what you see at the world tournament for instance with the teams from all over um yeah that that part has been very positive So you knew, I would like to, I want to dig more into that. I mean, especially like you, you know, more with regard to, you know, how the Henry Ford's program has, has evolved in that time, but you mentioned going to Tiffin and I know you've gone to, to other places as well. Uh, what do you notice about how other places do it compared to the way that you've kind of seen it in, in different ways is there a place that you like doing it a lot more is there a place that you'd see it on the calendar and you're like i gotta go here what's your mindset in that way yeah we really i really enjoyed going down and playing um playing in uh ohio village or playing in tiffin um and um you know the getting a feel for um the different vibe that those teams would carry all the way through their, you know, their style of play. I mean, think about Canal Fulton Mules or something like that. Um, the, these teams, and when they would come play us in our field, it was like, okay, these guys are out of, they really are from the past. Um, they, I think they had a lot higher percentage of, of players that were part of the historical society. And so they they put an emphasis on that. And uh, I mean, you know, you'd have Captain Ed Schumann hopping on the table before the ninth inning, firing up his troops. You'd have the the leaflets, so the anti train leaflets, and they'd be they'd be chasing the train. Um, so I think there's <laughs> there's some there's some magic that we've we've kind of drifted away from, uh, almost maybe um emulating what actually happened during that time as as more people got interested and teams focused on winning the game and it's it's really uh, I think we did lose something well, I absolutely agree with you on on that William I would go so far as to say Michigan has fallen into a category of you're, you you play to either be a la -di da or to play against the la -di das And it seems like that is some sort of measuring stick somehow of what your club is. Like, like you have teams all over the state that are – that get disappointed about not being at the world tournament. And then the, the argument comes up, what are, what are the criteria of playing at Greenfield village and the world tournament? What, you know, why do teams, why are they okay to come visit 
but not okay to ever get into the world tournament. And so you have teams adding skill instead of adding history. And, uh, and that, I think that I'm not blaming a lot of does, but I'm saying skill seems to have taken the forefront of fly, a fly vintage baseball in Michigan and maybe spreading to Ohio to, as far as history, no longer, if, if history drives your club, it doesn't get you to the tournaments, basically. Am I wrong on this? No, I think you're right. I think that's true. Um, uh, there was a lot of teams we used to enjoy playing. The uh, team from the Salt City team. Um, you know, teams that I don't know if they even exist anymore. But they all kind of... Um, they kind of developed independently in their own little corner of, of Michigan or Ohio. And uh, they had their own reason for existing. And uh, it was great when we would all come together and teams from Illinois, Indiana, and and Ontario. And, and I think there was uh, the things we had in common, these teams uh, were just the best things about baseball. Um, Likewise, and when we would need to add some players, uh, we would we would run a practice and we'd invite prospective players. And um, and you know, being the best player of the sport was not very high criteria. Um, you know, so we would we would judge uh, judge players on you know teamwork and character and uh friendliness and you know things like that um and somehow jeff got on the team i don't know i, I think he knows somebody <laughs> how'd that happen jeff money i had money that's what <laughs> i had teacher money <laughs> he had money built up from not being able to put towards his retirement so uh, <laughs> he has put it towards baseball yeah you know, Uncle Henry's got deep pockets, but not deep enough. Uh, but I, there, there are good points that I, I hear, you know, I, I, I hear, you know, both of you making about kind of, you know, this change, you know, going from, you know, the bound rule in when the Lottie Dawes started in 1992, 93 or so, and then 10 years later, adding the Nationals and then a conversion to the fly rule. And you can almost see the parallels between how our program does it versus how it kind of evolved in history at the same time too that you know it's going from bound rule and a lot more of the the local countryside and the the local smaller town clubs but eventually you know these these smaller areas are more interested in the big professional team in Cincinnati the big professional team in Boston. So um I I love that I love that connection because like we're you know we we're playing 1867 more than people in 1867 played 1867. <laughs> you know so yeah uh you know I think we've we've kind of uh you know evolved in in that way and seen how our game could be uh different from that. So so Bill I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom real quick. And that's, you know, if subtle or drastic and, you know, this may not be a permanent change, but what would you like to see in the vintage baseball world? If not at Greenfield Village, just in general, what would you think you'd like to see again or more of? Oh, that's easy, Jeff. That's easy. I would like to see those teams that are they look a lot like a softball team they do pretty good in the in the fly roll i'd like to have them out and play some bound roll with our fastest nine guys our mm -hmm. best place hitters um and let them hit the ball over the outfielder's head and have him catch it on a bound and he's out um you know we can't go back i mean but I think an occasional uh, match of 
of bound rule. Hey, maybe even play a little town ball ahead of time and, and show, show the people uh, different skill sets that, that are required for that sport. Bill, can we dive into town ball a little bit? You've, you've got a few town ball games under your belt as well. That's something that uh, the Henry Ford used to offer, uh, be it on the on the Village Green or uh, down on Walnut Grove. Talk to us about what town ball at Greenfield Village look like. Yeah, so we would play against the visitors. So it would be a collection of kids. And uh, if you don't know, town ball is a... Uh, is a predecessor to baseball. I'm going to get in trouble with Marcus Dixon here if I say too much about rules. But um, instead of bases, you've got four flags. Um, you can hit the ball forward or backwards. It's kind of a, a mushy ball that you're playing with. And you hit it and you run in no particular order. You just have to get to all four flags. So it and there's only one out per inning. So it's it's a semi-organized chaos and it's it's a lot of fun. You can be put out if someone catches the ball that you hit in the air, or if uh, while you're caught between uh, running between flags, someone soaks you. And when you get soaked, that means they they took that ball and they drilled you in the back with it. Um, now the kids that we play with. They love that aspect, so they would want to be the first to do it, and they would throw it as hard as they could, and you would duck. And so now the ball's in the outfield, and everybody's running around different flags, and you're losing track. Um, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of good fun, um, and um, good healthy exercise. Was this happening where you guys have the cricket exhibition right now? Exactly. Yes. And uh, the the one thing I hear about town ball, and by the way, if you go back in the archives, uh, season one, I think it was, we did a we did a town ball episode. One of the one of the top ten most downloaded episodes in the history of the show was an episode about town ball, and. Uh, did you find that it was something that you would get tired of, not only physically, because it's like baseball, soccer, but like there wasn't enough skill needed involved to play that game. And that's why evolution happened is when, when they say, when they refer to vintage baseball, let me rephrase this. One of the first things you would hear is, Vintage baseball, historic baseball, started out as a form of exercise. Uh, is that not where town ball really is the beginning of that, and then it evolved into a skilled sport eventually? Yeah, because it I sounds think... like to me, somebody who's never played town ball, that what it really is is exercise. Yeah, that, that's why it works so well with the visitors. We'd have kids, maybe some couple parents, but all, all ages playing. Um, you can figure out how to play in about 15 seconds. Um, nobody has specific positions. There's not even a number, a required number of players. So it's more like, um, something you would do at recess when you were in third grade. My kids and will, at the we'll time, go ahead, out. Jeff. Sorry. What, I'll, I'll take my students out. There's a specific day that we'll play town ball and they regularly say that was the most fun they have in this particular class and I teach it just because it once like in the situation you described Bill you you try to soak somebody and it goes past them and now everybody starts running and because there's no positions everybody's all over the place yeah I I distinctly remember one uh we had one guy on the team he would do this um there would be a, a hit and running and, and trying to catch and throwing. And then the dust would settle and they're looking around and where's, where's the guy who, who hit the ball. And he would, there's no rules. He was out way past the outfield. He was over by, you know, Martha Mary chapel, just jumping and waving his hands. And uh, so a kid would run for him and then stop and realize, 
wait, if I leave, all these other people are going to run around the flags and score. So now you got, he's just running around laughing. And I mean, the, the creativity, I think was, was, uh, was a fun part of the game. Um, there were a few rules, not too many, uh, and the rest you made up. It is it is a lot of fun. It's so much fun to 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 get involved with that game. And uh, for anybody who knows, you know Daniel Jones or any of the twenty first century town ball guys, uh, you know meet up with them, talk to them. They're they're recreating and you know doing a having a blast with that. Bill, there's one more baseball thing I want to ask you, and then we're going to take a short break, uh, and then we're going to get to know Bill Dean, the man, the myth, the normal person. Um, and this is one of the things that I've always wanted to, to kind of pick your brain about, uh, you know, for those who don't know, Bill, uh, tell us, tell us what, what positions were you when you first started vintage baseball? Yeah, I, um, I wanted to get way far away from the guy with the bat. So I played uh, outfield, I played left field, uh, for 15 plus years. Then I switched to playing catcher. And that's what I, that's what I do now. So I want to get into the why of that. Uh, there are probably, you know, lots of people listening, hopefully thousands of people listening, please be thousands. We need sponsors. <laughs> uh, uh, but we, uh... <laughs> you are dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you realize how badly I'd love to say, you know, you know, welcome to Roller Out the Barrel, presented by somebody. Um, but there, hopefully there's a lot of there's a lot of people, you know, listening that uh, you know, have become accustomed or they are that person at that position. Like they are the shortstop, they are the left fielder. And then, you know, a few years go by and you know, either you pick up a new player. Or something happens to you know to the to you physically. Uh, you you know you were the mainstay of left field, like you were the left fielder, I and mean, you got a you got a world tournament ring, sort of. Uh, you know, as as a left fielder, as a critical part of that 08 Ladidas team. But the transformation that you did to catching, um, you know, not only did you you know, transform yourself. But I think you really set a standard for how catchers are supposed to be and not just where you stick, you know, the, the player that can't move, you stick the player that can't run. Like when, when you went behind the plate, you all of a sudden stealing second was not a given anymore. Tell, walk us through, uh, you know, the, the transition to catcher and how you approach the game differently. If at all. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, if not for issues with my knees, I, I would still be playing left field. Um, I love playing left field. Uh, I was no longer able to to run enough, run fast enough. And, um, you know, I had a few surgeries, um, actually a partial replacement on one of my knees. And so I started looking around thinking, okay, if I'm going to day around, I need to do something besides this very uh, uh, run-oriented position. And so, um, yeah, it seemed like an obvious choice. And um, having, uh, you know, an outfielder arm uh, throwing from behind home plate down to second base was, was kind of seemed easy to me. Um, yeah, so I bought myself some more time uh, toward, I mean, the ultimate goal, of course, is to play baseball forever. And so um, that was just the next step, and and uh, it worked for me. And and I did change the way I I, uh, I prepare and, and practice and work on, um, you know, catching foul tips and things like that. Um, but no, it worked out beyond my wildest dreams. And it's in the shade. Yeah. How many uh how many of those best catcher mugs do you have that uh the world tournament gives out? I have two of those. 
two of those. And I have, I, I want to reach out now and say happy birthday to, to Yeti. Um, cause he had, a, he played a part in the second one. Um, in the first match oh, no. of the tournament, I threw three runners out in the same inning. And I know he was one of them. And um, so thank you. Happy birthday, uh, Landon. Oh, no. No. <laughs> I'm going to get I'm going to get a message about that, Bill. I, thanks. Here, here come the texts <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> as, soon as, this, as soon as this comes out, we're going to be getting the play by play. Like, it wasn't me. It was <laughs> it wasn't that's what it's gonna say it's gonna say it wasn't me he's got me mixed up with somebody else when i hit the ball i hit it far i end up on third i, I ain't just dealing bases <laughs> he's he's ready to blow his top right now i know it <laughs> all right uh, so so bill uh we're gonna take a we're gonna take a quick pause here uh we've got a we've got a news break coming in uh live news feed of uh, coming in from our uh out on field reporter um who's gonna who's gonna be breaking down a, a couple of couple of games that have just come across the wire and when we come back uh we're gonna be looking at you mr dean from uh a not quite as baseball standpoint and some of the the more interesting elements of your life so stand by and let me see let me pull up the telegraph here This is your Roller Out the Barrel news break for Sunday, October 4th, 1863. I'm Jonathan McLean. Dateline, Philadelphia. I'd rather be in Philadelphia. Chalk up two more bad guys and a real close baseball game. The Keystone and Athletic Baseball Clubs did battle on the field at the corner of 17th and Master Streets. For the Keystones, Mr. Perry and Mr. Dick each contributed home runs, but others and their rash running cost them tallies. On the athletic side, their leadoff hitter, Mr. Kleinfelker, and Mr. Gaskell, manning the first base, also had home runs. On the defensive side, Mr. Malone was pitching wildly, though Mr. Kleinfelker's catching more than made up for it. Mr. Reach of the Eckford Club served as umpire with perfect satisfaction, except for one or two instances. In the end, a few unfortunate misses on balls both on the fly and in the air, plus a last-inning rally that fell tragically short that led to the decision. Final score, Athletics 14, Keystones 13. Today's news break is brought to you by the Continental Theater on Walnut and 8th Streets. See Mr. G.W. Smith and his Grand Corps de Ballet. Experience Johnny Mac, the celebrated Ethiopian comedian. Over 100 different acts every night. The best and cheapest entertainment in the city. Only 25 cents. I'm Jonathan McLean, and this has been your Roller Out the Barrel News Break. All right. Jonathan McLean with his usual fine, upstanding segment. Jonathan McLean needs a t-shirt. He's got sponsors. Oh. How does he not oh, get? Oh yeah, we never see any of that business. I know. Where's Where's his barrel? Where does he get one? So, so, uh, so you Billy know uh, sponsors the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> this this barrel brought to you by. So barrel. so Bill, uh, we want to <laughs> we want to keep it a uh, keep it rolling here. Uh, we want to. You know, tell us about, you know, who you are, the person who you are, the when you're off the baseball field, who you are. If you're a lot of people know who you are uh, that are still playing, not playing anymore, but have met you before. Billy, tell us, what do you do for a living? Yeah, I'm a, I'm an engineer for a Ford Motor Company. And I have been for, oh, it's going on 34 years. So when you when you're in it, tell me oh, something ahead. you've engineered, Bill. Bill, tell me something you've engineered. Tell me so, something you played a part in. So when you're know. when you are uh, driving in your uh, whatever, what do you have a Corvette? Um, let's just say <laughs> you're driving in your sedan, 
um, and uh, having a nice drive. And then somebody, maybe a, a youngster, decides to roll the window down in the back. And you happen to be going at the right speed that creates this um, this unbelievable, loud, painful, um, throbbing sound as the air inside and outside the vehicle are fighting each other. Have you, have you experienced that before? I know this. Yes. Yes. So, Yes, absolutely. I know exactly what you're talking about. so I, uh, with uh, help from Ford Motor Company, own a patent for a system to resolve that, where... As um, once um, once somebody starts to roll a window down, um, one of the opposite windows uh, opens just enough, the right amount, uh, to alleviate that condition from happening. So I did that. So that condition absolutely happens because there's only a window on one side of the car open, correct? That's it, yes. So So... couldn't you just roll down? I, I really feel like you're scamming people here, Bill. Couldn't you just roll down the window on one side? <laughs> I feel Did like I do that all the time. yeah, but usually you are in, in such a state from the the unexpected and painful uh, feeling in your ears that you don't know This what's is true. going on. You might This roll the is window true. down too much. You might make it worse. <laughs> So, so yes, I hope I I do answered not your know question. the correct amount. So right, yes. It is. So I have I have actually recruited a couple of baseball players from the Ford uh, softball league. Um, Willie Big Red uh, Bieberstein and Honest Tom Capper were uh, also Ford employees, by the way. Willie himself also a two-time world tournament champion. So it, it's quite the, it's like, Oh, it's such God. a ballet with that Hell, thing. why did it, why did that come up? Why are we saying I'm just, that? Wait. I'm sorry. Hey, to be, to be fair, That conversation none of them, happened 15 minutes ago. What? to be fair, none of them, none of them are on the banner outside of Greenfield Village right now, Matt. Yeah, so I am When a, are you guys uh, going to get new banners? I am a proud graduate of uh, Lawrence uh, Technological University, Southfield, Michigan. Go Blue Devils. Uh, prior to that, I actually went to Henry Ford Community College for a couple of years. where I was uh, co-captain of the soccer team. Uh, before baseball took over, I played uh, uh, many, many, many years of, of soccer, both in school and in the uh, Detroit Soccer League. Um, so reference back to the knee injury problems uh, we talked about earlier. Um, So, so getting, going from that, you know, so we've, so this is the man who has designed a system that uh, if you ever get that whoop, 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 whoop sound, um, which that feature I don't believe That is was on amazing. the 20, the, the 2020 Ford Fusion SE, that feature is not on that. Uh, and I, I find that interesting that you bring that up. You had a dedicated Uh, Ford family vehicle that is not on there. Well, it hasn't gone on any vehicles yet, Jeff. That's something that I did learn somewhat recently. But um, you, you may be surprised to learn it will probably never go on any vehicle. Like a lot of... Uh, A lot of what I think are good ideas just don't uh, don't make it. But um, um, yeah, so I've worked on uh, a number of different uh, vehicles you might recognize the names of. The uh, Ford F-150, for instance. Um, did a lot of work on the Ford Escape. Traveled around, spent some time in Kansas City. Uh, went to the, uh, the, the Negro League Hall of Fame down there. It's fantastic. Um, worked on the expedition. I actually worked on the autonomous vehicle program for several years. Um, currently, I work on uh, the big delivery fans, the transit and the electronic transit. Bill, you've been around Greenfield Village for so many years. I got to ask my favorite question I ask any la -di da which has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now, but I don't want to forget to ask. You've been inside the museum hundreds of times. What is the one exhibit you have to step, 
stop by when you walk by it? Oh, the uh, the big locomotive, the Allegheny 1941 or whatever it is, the uh, the gigantic uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania Railroad monstrosity that I still cannot believe people would uh, actually hop in and, and carry things up and down the mountainsides. Um, yeah, that's got to be number one. Very intimidating. But I, I've also spent time walking around. Uh, Jeff, do you remember what Mr. Ossie's answer was to that question? Uh, no. Not off the top of my head. I believe his answer was he's quite partial to that hotel room exhibit where it's just got <laughs> oh, a hole in the oh, wall yeah. and you just walk by and look through the hole. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Bill. What were you saying? Um, the the uh, the air airplanes, the aircraft. There is uh, fantastic. Um, like the one that went up to the Arctic. You look at that thing. It's like that was a brave uh, group of people that got inside that thing and and left the Earth and flew and landed it. It still amazes me. <laughs> Speaking of a brave group of people doing something extraordinarily cold, I want to talk about one of the things that like blows my mind that if anybody ever asks about Bill Dean and I say, oh, did you hear he swam in all five Great Lakes on the same day? That's how impossible. Does, how, wow. <laughs> how did that, that adventure done. come to be? <laughs> <laughs> I hear that a lot. That can't happen. It's impossible. Well, no, it's possible. Um, and I would argue that uh, fewer people have have managed that caper than have uh, made it to the summit of uh, Mount Everest, I think, because really before the bridge was built, people weren't doing it. And really, why would you do it unless you were just doing it for the same reason I did, which was for the fun of it? Um, yeah, we were we were headed up to the UP for vacation anyway. And I just took a look at the map and I thought, well, if we stage this right and go over to the shores of Lake Ontario, spend the night there. Now, mind you, you, got, you better do this in July or August. But um, yeah, Lake Ontario, we got in there before breakfast. Lake Erie at Point Dover by 10. Uh, had some lunch. Went over to... Uh, the Blue Water Bridge, there's a park there, took care of uh, Lake Huron. Um, and then it really, it's an exercise in driving. Uh, so you drive all the way up, cross the Mackinac Bridge, uh, hang a left, Lake Michigan, beautiful uh, sandbar there. Uh, we, we we enjoyed it a little too much. We were getting, getting late on time, had to hustle and scurry up the I-75 the, the rest of the way to uh, to what is it, Brimley State Park, I think. Uh, his sun was about to set and we were rolling in there. I was I was thinking it might be like a John Candy or the Griswolds, uh, you know, the door would be closed, but no, no, the guard uh -huh. waved us through. And uh, yeah, we took care of Lake Superior about 9.30 and that was it, five lakes. You can do it, let's do it so together, the three of us. This was something you just thought up. You thought this up on your way to vacation. This wasn't even a plan until you were on your way somewhere. No, no, no. We 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 were we thought it up a few weeks ahead of time and uh, actually created a um, a special sign that has each of the lakes uh, placards on it. So we took pictures at each lake and each each. Successive lake, we uh, we added the placard for that lake on there. So I've got a series of pictures of me and my family um, uh, at each place until we got to the end where we had the complete sign. And uh, I did a really poor job, though, of planning dinner after that. Everybody was very hungry. I did have a hotel in Sault Ste. Marie, but, uh, yeah, the kids were grumpy because we had kind of a a 7-Eleven dinner, if, you, if you've done that.
before. It's like a big, box of big crackers, bite. and yeah, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> we had a much better time uh, the next night in uh, in Marquette, but uh, hey, it's totally doable. Uh, it's sort of fun. It's a lot of driving, but um, it's been ten years, and people still know me for that. So it's, it's 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 I find that pretty funny. It's such a like a cool idea. This idea of like you know, because a lot of people like outside of Michigan, you don't really realize how big Michigan is until you actually you have to go from like Metro Detroit to crossing the Mackinac Bridge and think, oh, once you cross the Mackinac Bridge to get in the Upper Peninsula, Lake Superior is right there. Like, no, it's still another few hours until you can get anything even remotely close to the lake. We were exceeding the speed limit on that stretch of road, I will say. We were the well, only we're... car going that way, too. <laughs> <laughs> we're from Michigan. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> well, don't, uh, don't do that. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, so you, Bill, you've mentioned being an engineer. You've got some design creds uh, to your name here. And we were talking before, and one of the design creds that even I don't know, I mean, you and I have known each other, you know, you were one of the first guys to, you know, reach out and, you know, welcome me. I was in center field and you were in left, you know, back in 2005. But one of the things I did not know is, you were you have the design cred for the Vintage Baseball Association's logo. That's true. That's true. Back um, back when there was a, a a periodical called the Early Innings Illustrated. Um, at um, I'm trying to think of um, <laughs> fellow's name that published that John something I think for the Muffins team. Um, yeah, they had a competition. They opened it up for logo design. And uh, I put one together, submitted it, and uh, it's been the logo ever since. I think my prize was supposed to be a Charlie Trudeau Phoenix Bat Company bat, um, which I don't know where that is. But hey, Charlie, if you're out there, we got to talk. Uh, Bill, you've been a member of the Lottie Dows for so long, and you were a catcher, so you're going to remember some good stories of tournaments in the rain. Give us a good catcher in the rain story. Oh, oh, boy. Hmm. Well, there was the um, um, mid-morning miracle Maybe it was not raining so much. It was reverse raining. It had rained all night. And then the uh, the sun came out and the water was literally pouring out of the grass up into our uniforms, uh, onto the ball and all the equipment and everything. So uh, I remember that game quite a bit as being very, uh, very dangerous and slippery. And uh, it worked in our favor because um uh, we ended up winning that match but um we did uh we did then retire to um somebody's house in dearborn who had a dryer and we were able to dry our clothes at least the pants um before our second match that was back when i remember back when catching... Grove couldn't do that I remember catching a game. The catching area is kind of up on a hill a little bit on the catcher's left, and it was muddy, and that was an issue for me. Uh, not ballerina-like in my normal day, certainly not on a muddy hill trying to catch Brian Besserell. Uh, that was a miserable day. Uh, Bill, the engineering thing, uh, that's, are you as much of an engineer as Wallowitz on Big Bang Theory? <laughs> no, not exactly. But, um, there was a point in my 
engineering career where I tried to intersect the baseball and the engineering. Uh, I was working with some really smart um, uh, computer engineers, and I proposed a, uh, uh, a question to them about what if I wanted to put something in a bat that would improve the, the power? And we had some pretty long discussions about that. Um, I think the rule with the bat is it has to be mostly of wood. Um, maybe I've got that wrong, but that's the that's the rule I told myself. And uh, yeah, I engaged some. Uh, I got some nerd power behind the idea, and uh, we we sketched up a few things. But um, in the end, it just really like everybody knows it's comes down to see the ball, hit the ball. Um, uh, also a failed uh, engineering uh, attempt was the the split grip bat with two, two handholds, the uh, second knob design that, um, yeah, Soap Dish and Stonewall were kind enough to um, create that bat for me for my drawings. Um, it, the drawing should have had an arrow pointing to the second knob. It said crack here because that's what happened <laughs> about the third time I hit with it. Uh, so, yeah, it was a good try. Um, it's just that bad. I should have called firewood. That way. The whole point of good innovations. We, we try our best. You know, we, we are a, a, a museum of innovation and so we we try things some work better than others yeah i still have my first bat jeff um victoria and it was, it was i think one of the first bats that that charlie made um he showed me a catalog there was something made in the 1800s called the red band series and um i said make me one like this charlie and but do something different with the stains. Do three different stains or something. And uh, and he did. He put a nice acorn knob on it. Uh, and then the the mistake I made though was he happened to mention that it sounds really good when you hit the ball with an oak bat. And I thought, boy, that's what I need—an oak bat. Uh, it's too heavy. It's too heavy. I don't use it. Uh, I probably used it the first year. I'll, I'll bring it out as a show bat once in a while. I might take a couple swings, but um, yeah, it, it will last forever. It is a gigantic oak uh, bat named Victoria. Just seems like like it's such like a great name and a great idea of a you know solid oak and because you're I'm sure you were not the only either baseball player of the 1800s or vintage baseball player that said oak. Sure. Right. But then uh, the bat that I did have success with, which I call the Texas Wind Cheater, was a a replica from a Rochester Grangers bat. We we played them up at their field one, uh, one afternoon, and uh, they let me borrow that bat, and I really liked it. Um, so I contacted them over the winter and made a trip up there, and... Uh, I got the serial number from the bat, <clears throat> and uh, it was a Phoenix bat, and Charlie made me uh, a brand new one. All right, Bill, we're uh, we're running towards the end. Unless, uh, Matt, you want to ask the last question before we finish it? Obviously, your bat, Victoria, was named after Victoria Principal, who played Pam on the series Dallas for many years in the 80s. So I, I, I think that's uh, that's obvious because I don't know any other Victorias. Who was the bat named after? That's that's my daughter's middle name. Your daughter wasn't good enough for you to name her name the bat after her first name. What what do you <laughs> what do you mean the middle name? <laughs> was she not good at cartwheels, Bill? Were you embarrassed by her cartwheels, and that's why you used the middle name? Shut up. <laughs> so yeah, so she she's my daughter, so we call her Whip Smart. Uh, we've got a whiplash. We get a whole 
whole collection of nicknames going over here. That's that's like better stories. My my bed is named Eloise, and uh, the people ask like if that's a family member, and I said no, that's the uh, that's the insane asylum that's down the street from where I grew up. <laughs> I like so, those bat better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. So, Bill, we're going to we're going to wrap up this episode in the in the way that we uh finish all of the episodes with uh or many of our episodes, many of our guests. Uh we'll be a little segment we call Hit 'em with the old pepper. We're going to throw a bunch of questions at you. Uh you're going to answer with usually either the first thing off the top of your head or something in kind of quicker response. But the idea is don't think, just act. Lightning so, round. Lightning round. Beryl and I are going to go back and forth. Uh, I am going to, I'm going to start us off. And then we're going to go back to back. Again, don't think, just act. What was the first baseball <laughs> hat you remember wearing? Doesn't think. Oh, that was my Weatherly Wildcats uh, team cap. Name oh, did you mean a professional a professional team? I'm sorry. I be, either or both. Yeah, that would be Detroit Tigers. Name a vintage baseball pet peeve you have. Oh, when uh, when the batter lets the ball hit him instead of stepping out of the way, because my knees aren't great, and I got to walk up there, pick up the ball. Somebody just stole third. I don't really care. Just get out of the way. <laughs> you can probably relate. I think we all just had the same person in mind when uh, when we heard that. Uh, an animal that isn't a normal pet, but if it was, you wish you could have one. Groundhog. Specifically the one that's outside my house by the deck. Bill, name your three favorite cheeses. Oh, you did it. You did it to me. Uh, I don't I don't like cheese. I hate to say it. Um, what? Uh, okay, forget I said that. Uh, Parmesan. Uh, no, 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 you're lying. You're uh, lying. Blue cheese. I don't want you to lie. I am. She's lying to you right now. <laughs> Name your three favorite condiments. Oh, uh, I put salsa on stuff. I like black pepper. Um, I like some olive oil. I put that on a lot of things. Mm, classy. Next, the uh, if you the next VBBA conference that you go to, what is the session that you wish was being taught and you would absolutely go to it? Oh, oh, the um, yeah, that would be the one on knee replacements. Um, <laughs> while you wait, I believe the knee replacement VBBA conference happens at the bar afterwards when everybody's sitting, <laughs> sitting at a table. <laughs> what is your favorite baseball smell? Oh, that's the um, yeah, a well oiled baseball mitt, even though we don't use those in our game. I had the Rennie Best. Stinnett model, by the way, Pittsburgh Pirates. Ooh. Best looking mm -hmm. and ugliest car you've ever seen. Uh -huh. Oh, man. Oh, boy. Too many. Too many. <laughs> uh, my, my neighbor, when I was a kid, my neighbor had uh, a nice... Uh, early 60s Corvette black. I somehow always think about that car. I was just a little kid, but I remember that car. Uh, and the ugliest, I had a friend in high school who had a Volkswagen thing. If you're familiar with that, it's it looks like uh, something f used as an extra part in a movie. All the panels come off and it was hideous. A lot of fun though. And not comfortable. We had one when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Uh, a terrible, fun. terrible vehicle. 
Uh, Bill, what was your first car? That was a 1972 Ford Galaxy 500. Um, yeah, the brakes didn't work one morning. I ended up on the on the median on outer drive there. And then I, I swore to the police officer I could safely drive it home if I just took side streets. He didn't think that was a good idea. <laughs> we sold that car challenge for, accepted. We sold that car for a penny a penny a pound. And it was we got thirty five bucks, I think. Wow. Uh weirdest non baseball subject that you could hold a conversation in. Or that you would consider yourself an expert in? Uh, that's that would be the um, the Helmholtz resonance. Um, it's it's when you blow air across a Coke bottle or a beer bottle and makes that makes that sound. It's also responsible for that that wind throb that you get in your car windows. Yeah, so I was just about to say that. I could go on. I could go on, <laughs> but I won't. Uh, Bill, quote your favorite movie. Oh boy, um, that would be um, boy, you've got a panty on your head. That was from Raising Arizona. Uh, you it. leave, you leave tomorrow, Bill. What country are you headed to? Australia. And Bill, then from Australia, I'm going to go to Lord um, Lord Howe Island, which is back uh, east uh, a couple hours. Looks like a James Bond villain hideout. Look it up. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Bill, give me your Mount Rushmore of your personal favorite Cincinnati Reds. That's going to be, um, yeah, Joe Morgan, T Tony Perez. I got to go Pete Rose because I always wore number 14, no matter what sport. And Johnny Bench. Fun fact, number 14 was also my number in from about middle school forward it's still my lucky number still to this how day. does it always come back to you jeff it <laughs> all... <laughs> because of money because of teacher money <laughs> uh bill the international pizza commission is meeting uh what ingredient are you recommending be eliminated forever well cheese come on uh, Bill, what board game do you consider yourself really good at? Whoa, whoa. I think, uh, sorry. I like sorry. Pretty good at it. Besides Raising Arizona, which movie or Broadway show do you wish you had been in? Ooh. Oh. Um, let's go with, um, yeah, uh, Book of Mormon. Great show. What was the first, what was the first concert you ever went to? Ah, I went and saw the band Yes at the Olympia in 1978. Ooh, owner of a lonely heart. Is that Yes? This Wonder concert was Wonder before Wonder? that song came out. Yeah, I say that was in the 80s. <laughs> oh, wow. You don't know. It could uh, have been a song from the 70s that just never got popular until they got more popular. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, what is the food or drink that you have to have in your house? And if you don't, you know you have to go grocery shopping. Oh, that's going to be um, eggs every morning. I oh, have yeah. You're an egg guy. Half a dozen every morning for probably 20 years. Not all the yolks, Bill, don't worry. Bill, if you had a twin brother, what would his name be? 
Bob. So it would be like Billy Bob. Billy Bob. Parents could, parents could just say Billy Bob and we'd both come running. Hey, you told me not to think. <laughs> Don't think, just act. That no, is true. Said that. I never said that. <laughs> um, oh, I just had it. Oh, okay. This is my last one. What is the, what is a, you know, either the trophy or a non-baseball tr based trophy that you wish you could win? Ooh, I would say um, an Olympic gold medal, if that's uh, if that's fits the category. It does. I would. But something, All right, last something one. not dangerous, like uh, you know, I don't know, equestrians or something. Last one for me is cereal a soup. I'm sorry, is did you say cereal? Yes, is cereal a soup? Is it a soup? No. Yes. No, it is not. Yes, it is. <laughs> is and is a hot dog a sandwich? Negative. No. It is not. <laughs> but Pop Tarts are ravioli. I think that's a <laughs> well billy we uh we appreciate your time we uh it's it's been great talking with you there's nothing like you know the weather is starting to get nice here i know some of our vintage baseball friends around the country are are already getting going here but it's nice to nice to catch up nice to talk with you and uh we uh we really appreciate you coming on board with us today oh my pleasure my pleasure this was uh a lot of great fun. Thank you. Good. Uh, Bill, I just want to say every time that I've ever had an interaction with you, it's always been very pleasant. Uh, you're a great guy to, you're one of the people that I search out to, even if her interaction only lasts five seconds and it's just a, a handshake or a pat on the shoulder. Uh, I always look forward to seeing you, uh, even though we're not besties. That's very nice to say. To that. And I could say the same for you. I think you do you do a great service. Uh I've listened to the podcast. It's fantastic. So uh, best of luck with it. Well, thanks. It's Jeff's now. Uh he's getting a logo. So. <laughs> <laughs> Season five, baby. Season five. <laughs> well, on uh on behalf of uh, on behalf of Bill Dean, uh, we we appreciate for everybody who is uh, watching us on YouTube. We appreciate everybody who's listening in on Podbean and wherever podcasts are available. We appreciate your time, and we thank you, and we hope that you are uh, staying safe and getting ready to get that vintage baseball itch a scratching. Uh, Mister Roller, would you mind taking us out? Owner of a lonely heart. Better than I own it.